Into the Fog, Part 3, Rebellion An original short story by Charlie C.C. Thomas Day 40 Michael lay in his bed, daughter nestled in the crook of his arm, eyes shut as light funneled down into his dreams and made them come alive. He stood as an invisible observer on the front porch, overlooking the Christmas lights and the fog as it crept closer, centimeter by centimeter, until they were little more than a blurry twinkle surrounding the house. Then a voice broke the thick silence, sweet and gentle as his head swiveled left and found Debbie knelt beside Blue's grave, the foot of the earthen mound nearly kissing the fog. She hummed in a white nightgown, hair loose and draping over her back like a shawl, sweeping around to cover her face as her fingers toyed at the edge of the grave dirt. She sat on her heel and leaned forward, hands diving into the earth and ripping it away, fingers too long and too pale, slinging the dirt across the lawn until the mound was a hole. She leaned closer, giggling as she stared into the shallow pit at Blue's corpse, tilting her head like a curious dog behind the veil of her inky hair. Then she crawled inside and grunted with a laugh, hoisting Blue's rotting corpse up until she looked like she were sitting upright against the wall of the grave. He blinked and shifted closer until he stood over the hole, and Debbie smiled, too wide and too sharp. Her dress and skin stained, hair full of dirt, eyes ringed in dark hazel. She plopped down next to Blue and looked up at him with a tired grin before her hands shot up and grabbed Blue's chin. Hello, Michael, she said in his wife's voice, but with a childish tone. She jiggled Blue's, his wife's, chin, the cloudy eyes drifting apart at odd angles, the flesh gray as her mouth dribbled liquid rot. I've missed you so much. How long has it been? Five years, you say? Oh, that's too long. Come, my love, kiss me. Debbie squeezed her fingers around her mother's mouth until they bunched together into an ugly expression, then made kissing sounds before she giggled and laughed, and laughed, and laughed, her voice deepening all the while. With breakfast made, Michael and Debbie sat at the dining table, plates of eggs and hash browns steaming as Michael stirred the food on his plate. He flicked up at Debbie as she cut her eggs with her fork, looking out the window and chewing. She was no different than yesterday, tall and thin, hair almost black, eyes and earthy brown hemmed in charcoal, skin tan and freckled. She was Debbie. Blue had seemed normal too, he thought, still toying with his breakfast and sipping his coffee. She's not blue, he reminded himself. But the dreams... The dreams about blue always came true. And Debbie... isn't... blue, he retorted, then jolted his eyes back down, lips pressed tight as he scraped the fork over the plate and shoved the food into his mouth, Debbie flinging her hands over her ears at the high shriek of the plate. Dad, she complained. He smiled and apologized before she sighed and leaned on the table, sliding her food away. Do you know where we are? In our house, he said quickly. No, I mean here. You said it's just a cliff outside, right? Well, where are we? He sighed and shook his head. You know that I'd tell you if I knew that, Debbie Cake. Well, why is the fog here? You said there's bad wind, right? Shouldn't that blow the fog away? And how far down does it go? Does it go on forever? Are we floating? How is that possible? She sat up, arms out on the table, palm up. I don't know, baby. And all I know is the fog's here, and wherever the fog is, there's no ground. Just more fog and those creatures. He took a bite of hash brown inside, stomach growling. I really should eat more, he thought. Do you know how long it'll be like this? She asked, her face drooping like she did in her chair, arms pulling close to her body as she slumped and drifted back out to the swirling fog. Or where everyone is? He reached across the table, hand just above it. 
She turned at the movement and found his eyes before he smiled and wiggled his fingers. She sighed and rolled her eyes, taking his hand. He squeezed it and spoke calmly with a genuine grin. I don't know why, but we're here, and I will do everything in my power to make sure that nothing bad happens to you or us. We're in this together now, right? She sighed, and he repeated himself. Then she nodded and gave him a little grin, eyes flicking up to his, then at her breakfast before she answered. Yeah. We're in this together, old man. Later, Michael's eyes creaked open from his nap, the light significantly dimmer than when he'd lain down on the couch. He sat up and groaned, cracking his neck as he swung his legs over the edge and stood, wobbling with a yawn into the kitchen. He called for Debbie, rubbing his eyes and repeating himself, but she didn't answer. He blinked past the sleep and stood straight, swiveling around as he opened the pantry. She wasn't there. He checked the garage, the basement, ran upstairs, but she wasn't inside. He sprinted back to the stairs and stopped at the upstairs window, heart fluttering as the first day in the fog screamed in his mind. Maybe she'd gone. Maybe she'd walked over the edge. Maybe she was just a hallucination so that he could cope with being truly alone. Then he froze, pins and needles creeping in his hands, feet, and face as he fixed on Debbie beside Blue's grave. He bolted downstairs to the front door, the planks all stacked neatly aside. He flung open the door, half wondering how she could have taken them down before he jumped off the porch steps. Debbie! She turned, half startled to meet his panic. He swallowed, forcing a smile. She wasn't in all white. Her hair wasn't down, her face wasn't different, and her hands weren't too long. She was just Debbie. The dream lied he thought as she smiled, sheepishly at first, then wider as he beckoned her over. Sorry, Dad, I just... Her smile turned nervous as he approached and wrapped an arm around her shoulder. He sighed and nodded, heart slowing in his chest as he spoke. No, it's, it's okay, but you can't be out here alone, all right? If you wanted to see her, you should have just woken me up. He rubbed her shoulder and kissed the top of her head. Do you still want to see her? Maybe talk to her? Debbie thought for a moment, then shook her head. There's no point, is there? She found his eyes with an odd smile. What's gone is gone. I'd just be talking to the ground, I guess. That'd be funny. He smiled nervously and nodded, gesturing for her to go inside while looking at Blue's grave. He sighed through his nose and followed her, shutting the door as he thought. The dream lied. Day 41 As Michael lay in his bed with Debbie on the opposite side, light fell into his eyes and swam together beneath his lids until his dream was stitched together. He stood on the steps of the porch, motionless as an apathetic alien, while Debbie twirled around the front yard. She smiled too wide, hair brown and eyes flecked in gold as she laughed, her white gown spinning around her slender legs while long, spidery hands flew out like propellers. Her loose hair shot out like a fan. Then she tripped and black speckles filled the fog. She shook her head and groaned as she stood, the black shapes coming closer until they poked through. Then cat-sized things with feathery wings, plumage black and oily, as pale feet clawed their roosts with black talons. Burnt yellow beaks opened in squawks as white eyes flicked around the yard. Debbie turned at the sounds, her smile widening as she spread her arms and called them her friends. They fell on her in waves. Dozens landing on her body until she fell from the weight of them. Then came their beaks and claws, digging into her skin and pulling away strand after strand as she giggled and laughed, roiling in the darkening grass like they were tickling her. Then the next wave came, and the next, until the lawn was speckled with black blood and chunks of flesh, 
leaving Debbie to lay in the grass, a bloody skeleton with her mangled organs spilled over the lawn. Her butchered face turned side to side with gurgling laughs as she caught her breath, lidless eyes exploring the sky and lipless mouth trying to smile. I should show Daddy how to play. Michael's eyes opened with a gasp. He looked down, flicking around until he remembered he was in his own room, landing on Debbie beside him. She lay on her side, back to him and curled around herself. He sighed and set a hand on her shoulder, sliding it away to lay on his chest as his heart calmed. Several hours later, Michael stood in front of his bedroom window as a hundred little creatures like the ones in his dream loitered around the lawn and over the house. He ground his teeth, eye twitching as he shut the blinds like he'd done downstairs not long ago before they noticed him inside. He turned and jumped as Debbie watched him from the doorway, her face almost blank. Is that my fault? No, he said. But that is why neither of us should be outside alone. But I was making a lot of noise. They could have heard me in the yard. She looked down, the expression apologetic, but it didn't reach her eyes. He sighed through his nose, ignoring last night's dream. It's all right. We'll just have to find something to do inside today. All day? Until the birds leave he said, motioning for them to go back downstairs. How long do they usually stay for? It depends. No two are the same, I guess. It came quicker than he'd meant. Well, what's wrong with them? She asked as they approached the hallway window, the one that he'd forgotten to cover. I don't know. They're mutated, changed, for some reason. It was a little too hard, but she didn't say anything. Like blue. He stopped, hands mid-air as he reached for the tied-back curtains. He lowered his arms, the bristled annoyance snuffed out as he set his hands on her shoulders, hugging her from behind and kissing the top of her head. Unfortunately. She looked out the window as he pulled back, thinking she wanted to look at him, but found her staring at something outside. Brow furrowed as she shifted away and turned to face it. He looked outside and stared, squinting his eyes as they both came closer to the window, forgetting about the birds. What is that? She asked as a massive shadow grew in the fog over the house. They stood there in silence for a moment before he answered her. I don't know. It grew and grew, getting closer every second as Michael set up a lawn chair at the top of the stairs to watch it with an old pair of binoculars. The birds still hadn't left by the time the fog had parted, but he was far enough back that most didn't notice him, and the ones that did only pecked the glass before moving on if he stayed still. Debbie sat in front of the window for a while, then went downstairs, then back up to bother him with more questions half of which he couldn't answer, before she lay on her back under the window, then turned to the wall and fell asleep. He smiled down at her before flicking back up to the shape as the fog parted around the massive shadow over them. Earth. It was a massive rock and cement sphere with strands of something dangling off here and there. He sat straight and furrowed his brows. It won't hit us, he thought. The angle's all wrong. It's almost flying. It is flying, he continued aloud and watched. Time ticked on as the light of the fog dimmed to evening. Five hours. It took five hours for the rock and cement and dirt boulder to move completely over the house. He'd crept down and out of the back door, tiptoeing barefoot in the lanai to watch the flying clod of earth inch away. When it was almost gone into the fog, the birds cawed until every one of them picked up the cry and took wing, 
flying after the floating island and leaving him with as many questions as Debbie. Day 42 Michael stood in the kitchen, invisible and paralyzed as Debbie busied herself over the stove, whisking the mixing bowl's worth of eggs as she eyed the bacon, sizzling, popping, and burning, and smiled, stepping back. She sighed, skin almost translucent in the fog's light, black hair now brown in a wild mess as bony hands worked the eggs onto the floor as much as around the bowl. She dumped them into a pan with a hissing sizzle and tossed the bowl into the sink, graying hand taking up a spatula to stir them around as the other picked the bacon out with tongs and set the strips beside. She smiled, gums pale, teeth yellow, and lips purple as cloudy eyes flicked over her work. Look, Dad, she said. I made us breakfast then reached into the pan of eggs with her bare hand and thrust it toward him, the skin turning black and peeling away to show her dead, purple flesh. Michael opened his eyes with a sharp breath, sockets tender and throbbing like he'd stared at the sun for too long. He sat up and rubbed his temples, ignoring the pulsing ache as much as the dream, and shuffled through his routine eventually finding his way downstairs and wrinkling his nose at the bitter smell of burnt coffee and overcooked food. Chills wound up his spine as he rounded the corner, the dream overlaying reality as he found Debbie standing by the counter, her cloudy eyes and pale face, her nest of hair, her bony joints. He blinked, and the dream was gone. She was just Debbie, with bright eyes and messy hair. He smiled around a gulp, and looked around at the clean kitchen, landing on the covered plates of food at the dining table. "'What's all this?' he asked, hand stroking over her head as he stooped to kiss her forehead. "'Good morning to you, too,' she said sarcastically, and stepped back, spreading her arms with a wide, toothy grin. Then she lunged forward and took his hand, dragging him into the dining room as she shouted, "'I made us breakfast and some coffee. Come on, come look!' He sat down with a laugh that tapered off as she uncovered the food, smile still plastered on his face as he stared at the burnt bacon and half-scorched, half-runny eggs. Then she made a noise and scampered off to the coffee station, returning with a mug of coffee that looked like it was mostly milk. He smiled up at her and sighed with a smile, gesturing for her to join him as he grabbed his fork. I want to see you take the first bite, she said and leaned on the table with a grin that made her brown eyes almost hazel. He smiled with a nod and picked up a strip of bacon, stiff as wood, and crunched it between his teeth. It disintegrated to charcoal, leaving the flavor of an unwashed grill across his tongue. He cleared his throat and set the piece down, reaching for his coffee and forcing his face to keep from wrinkling at the smell. He took a quick sip of the burnt coffee and swallowed just as fast, putting his fingers over his mouth as he coughed, the dust from the bacon sticking to his throat. He found her eyes, and she lifted her eyebrows like she were going to ask a question. He nodded with a forced smile and scooped up a bite of the eggs, fork crunching through the skin of the gelatinous insides. He leaned over his plate to keep from wearing it and slurped the eggs in, eyes twitching as the salt hit him in the face and burned away the flavor of raw egg. He swallowed, mouth twisting as he reached for the coffee and sipped it again, eye twitching at the burnt, salty concoction. It's... different, he said. I like it. Thank you for breakfast, Debbie Cake. A genuine smile traced up his face, But a moment later, hers fell into a scowl as she grabbed the plate and slung it across the room. Michael jumped back, chair skidding on the hardwood as she swung her arm out and cast the mug away, shattering it to the floor. You don't like it! You hate it! Debbie slammed her hand down and caught the knife's edge, standing blade up on its back. She heaved and panted as Michael stared into her light eyes skin almost the same as his in the fog's light, messy hair full of brown streaks. Then he blinked, 
and found her hand. The blade stuck halfway through. He lurched forward, hand on hers, as he pulled her arm toward him and slid the knife free, turning her hand over and gulping when his fingers brushed the edge of the wound. There was no blood. They stared at one another, her face softening as she watched him examine the gouge, swallowing when he met her eyes. Her hazel eyes. He pulled away and stood, leaving her to clutch her own bony hand with the other as he explained that he'd need the first aid kit, and returned without thinking about what he was doing. His heart thudded in his chest, eyes wide and body tingling with adrenaline as shaking fingers disinfected the cut, running along the edge again and swallowing. It was rough like a callous and dry as jerky when he was done with the alcohol. Then he flicked back to the kid and started wrapping her hand with a bandage, carefully flicking up her skinny arms with the dark veins showing in her palms, wrists, and elbows. Those are normal, right? He thought. She's normal. She's Debbie. Just like Blue was Blue. He chided himself and finished dressing the wound ignoring the discolored stripes in her skin as she rubbed her arms and backed away. I'll just... Then she smiled like nothing was wrong and became his Debbie again. I'll put the rest of breakfast away. But you should finish. You're too skinny. What about you? He asked, following her as she returned to the stove and dumped the leftovers into a container. She looked over her shoulder with an innocent grin. I'll eat later. Day 43 Michael sat on the couch in the living room, Debbie on the floor in front of him, leaning against his legs. A movie she'd picked played on the television, but he couldn't see it, couldn't hear it, could only stare at the back of his daughter's head. His body was rigid, skin crawling where her broad back touched his jeans. Just like blue. His voice whispered in the back of his head. Her black hair was almost auburn now, braided over one of her shoulders, which were wider than even yesterday. Her legs were crossed, longer and spindly, just like her arms folded up in her lap and her spine had grown enough that she had to hunch to stay the same height that she'd been yesterday. He swallowed, eyes flicking to the still-broken front window and back again, ignoring the dark shadow in the fog. Dad, what would happen if we sent Blue over the edge? He shifted in his seat, leaning on the arm of the couch as his hand traced over his mouth. I don't know, baby. Would she come back like the food, do you think? She asked without looking over her shoulder. I don't know. He said more forcefully than he meant to. What if we die here? She tilted her head, still facing the movie as the music climbed. I, I, I don't know, Debbie. What if we jumped off the edge? Do you think that we'd fly forever, or would we hit the bottom eventually? I don't know. He cut himself off as she shifted her gaze to the window and the enormous shadow in the fog. He followed and wrinkled his forehead as the fog parted around a huge boulder of earth and concrete, sailing by at an angle so it almost ran parallel the front of the house. Its bottom caught his mangled car in a flurry of sparks and screeches as it dragged it over the driveway and flipped it into the lawn. Michael stood, sliding his legs from behind Debbie to rush to the window. He leaned against the sill on the side with the least amount of cracks and slowly tracked the thing as his car turned end over end beneath the misshapen ball of earth until it finally teetered free in the middle of the lawn. Then the air buzzed and giant things swarmed around the yard. Huge dragonfly-like creatures with fleshy heads and interlocking jaws that let them strip the trees of their leaves and bark. One of them landed in the garden beside the porch and gnawed on the bushes, its mandibles like tiny hands pulling the leaves and bark alike into its mouth. And in just a few moments, 
Everything but the grass was stripped bare, and the locusts flew back after their floating island, which had already almost passed. Michael made for the front door, pulling down the planks and bars to swing it open and creak onto the porch, watching the tail end of the other island curve down into the fog. He stepped forward, squinting as it descended and revealed something like a steeple or the corner of a roof, but then it was gone, swallowed by the fog. And moments later, even its shadow was gone. I think we might just fly, Debbie said from the living room, drawing Michael's eyes he crept back inside. Fly and fly and fly. Day 45 Michael stood in his backyard, motionless, invisible, and helpless, as Debbie backed toward the Christmas lights, blazing against the fog like a ring of cold fire. She stepped over them, the fog blurring her at the edges as she gave a small grin and spread her arms wide. I think we'd just fly, she whispered and fell back, face changing as she dove, hidden in the fog. Michael opened his eyes, hand shooting up as he blinked the sleep away and looked around, heart racing until he remembered he was in his bedroom. He fell back into the sheets, arm coming up over his face with an exhale before he groaned and felt his forehead for fever. There was nothing, just the pulsing throb in his head. Later, as evening came and the fog dimmed, Michael stood in his daughter's doorway, arms crossed as he leaned on the post. She was in her pajamas like she had been all day, her hair loose and draping her like an auburn shawl streaked with dark blonde. She stared out her window into the fog, long bony legs crossed, longer back hunched forward as spindly arms sat near dead at her sides. Do you want something to eat? he asked flicking between the sunken face behind her hair and the plate of rib bones across from her, gnawed clean. She didn't answer, didn't move, just stared out her window and breathed. His face twisted as he wiped his mouth, eyes tracing along the sharp edges of her collarbones, her shoulders, the grooves of her ribs poking through her tank top. He stared at how her wrists and elbows bulged, like clubs, how her fingers and toes were like skeletons, the tendons almost ripping through her paper-thin skin. He shivered, chest tight as hot tears welled in his eyes, but he cleared his throat and motioned toward her. You, um, uh, want me to take those out, or are you, uh, still working on them? He tried for a laugh, but the smile didn't reach his eyes as he waited for her to respond even the tiniest glances away. But there she sat, still, quiet, and cold, veins bulging and dark. Then her finger twitched, and her arm trembled, rising into the air to point out her window. He froze, flicking between her and it, then back before he opened his mouth to speak and shut it again as a shadow fell across the house. He stood straight, arms down and eyes wide as another asteroid of dirt and concrete parted the fog, this one falling and only yards away. The vapor stirred into a hundred spirals as it passed, lowering next to his side of the yard and almost scraping the edge of his lawn away. His lips parted, heart racing as his eyes flicked side to side and stopped, as the top of the island came into view. It was his house. It was his yard. The car was parked in the driveway. The porch was stripped of its planks. The windows were boarded up from the inside. Christmas lights twinkled around the edge of the yard, most of the bulbs blown now. Michael swallowed, a nervous smile creeping up his face as he stepped forward. Then it fell slack on the snow-white upright creature that walked around the back corner of what appeared to be his house. It was tall and lithe, with legs like a doe 
and a woman's chest and face. White hair long and wavy as golden eyes stared through the fog. He bolted forward, tripping, catching himself on the window frame, and stared with his eyebrows arching up. She gave a sad smile, his wife's sad smile, as her island passed, and she waved, stepping forward and looking up at the window. He opened it and pulled himself outside, a few stray tears trekking his cheeks as she lowered her hand, and they watched each other. He mouthed, I love you, and she smiled, face twisting in pain as she mouthed them back, and set her fingers to her mouth, kissing them, and opening her hand like it might flutter away. He opened his hand to catch it, and pulled his closed fist to his chest as she sank deeper into the fog, his face twisting. Then she was gone. Then the house was gone. And then he was alone with Debbie, and pulled himself back inside, opening his hand over his chest and ignoring the tears still on his face. She looked up at him with yellow eyes flicking down to his hand, still on his heart, and then his face. Her thin lips parted, jaw muscles visible beneath her skin, as she whispered something. He furrowed his brow and came closer, sitting on her bed at an angle. I said, how much longer, Dad? His eyes burned, and his guts twisted. He wanted to scream to shout, to let his boiling insides come out and stop all of it from happening. But instead, he took her hand, careful not to squeeze too hard, and sighed, controlling the anger in his voice as he met Debbie's new eyes. Debbie, I don't... I don't think it'll be much longer. Day 46 Michael stood with his back to the side of the house, Debbie beside, arms crossed, then hands at his hips as the island drifted closer, slipping beneath their own. It had crawled forward for the better part of eight hours, and was finally close enough to inspect without binoculars, a perfect replica of his house, his car, even the damage to the living room window, even Blue's grave. Michael sighed, stepping closer until the dark Christmas lights were at his shins, eyes trailing the board-up windows until he furrowed his brow at something on his bedroom side of the house. It was wooden and metal, mounted on a platform branching off the wall with a seat near the house and a loaded ballista sitting nose down in the yard. He crossed his arms again, ignoring the goosebumps bristling up his shoulders as Debbie approached silent as a cat. Is it our house? She asked in a faint voice like she could hardly breathe. His eyes flicked to her then back, never turning his head. It's a replica, if nothing else. What do you think you'll find when you go over there? Probably the same things we have here. But maybe some clues, more supplies that won't come back when they're gone. She was silent a moment, then said, There was something alive on that last one. Does that mean there could be another us? I don't know. If there are other uses, what does that make us? Ourselves. But if they're us too, and we're them... She swallowed and coughed, drawing his eye. She matched him in height now, shoulders like a linebacker and body long and slender beneath unchanging legs. But she was a skeleton, wearing a dark, veined skin. Her eyes were yellow, hair blonde, face longer and slender with sunken cheeks. She slouched, blinking heavy eyes and wiping her lips with delicate, knobby fingers. If we're them... Who are we, 
really. Enough existentialism, he said, flicking back to the house, jaw tense. What's that? He sighed, asking questions about why we're alive and what matters. But isn't that important? She faced him, face blurry but emotionless in the corner of his eye. Yes, but let's not ask it right now. The words came clipped like the rest, but low as he forced his eyes to crawl over the contraption on the other house. But if this is our house, and there could have been other us's, then when did we really get here? He shut his eyes, guts churning at the thought as he kneaded his fingers into his own hips. Is this even our home? He rubbed his eyes, teeth grinding together. Is this the real world? He cast his hands down and spun to face her as she finished. Are we even ourselves? I don't know, all right? I just don't know. I don't have the answers, and frankly, I don't care to ask. I wake up in this hell. My dog turns into some bastardization of my dead wife and dies all over again. Then my daughter manifests from nothing and is turned into another monster before my eyes. He flung his arms up to motion around him, eyes wide. Do I look like I have answers? Any? He waited, and she stared at him, eye level as she hunched, putting his hands on his hips and leaning forward. Hmm? Because I don't. I might not be real. This may all be a dream. You may not be the real Debbie. Blue wasn't blue, he scoffed. Maybe my wife never even died. He laughed and spun, admiring the churning void of fog that danced around him, taunted him. Then he sighed, the fire blown out in an instant as he slumped and scraped his hands down his face with a groan. He pinched the bridge of his nose and sighed, facing away as he spoke. I'm sorry. Baby, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said any of that. He lifted his head as he turned to find the thing that she'd become. She looked at him from the corner of her eye, face too long and too slender, emotionless, set like stone. Then she took a slow, rattling breath and let it fall with her words. You tire of me. She kept her eyes fixed on Michael as she strode forward and stepped over the Christmas lights. He reached, but was too far away. Since this has outlived its usefulness. She stood with her back to the edge, spread her arms like she might fly, and leaned her head back as Michael dove for her, her name on his lips as she slid off the edge. He screamed for her three times as he clamored on his stomach, ripping the lights away to get at the edge and scrambling his hands over the dirt wall for hers. But there was only the fog and the island creeping beneath them. His eyes flicked over the lawn, through the air, up to the porch, all around the house, but she wasn't there. Yet his mind raced. There's no wind. She must have landed in the front yard, he thought. Then where is she? Maybe she went inside, but why dive in the first place? Maybe she's gone insane. Altered mind and body? It, it doesn't matter. He launched to his feet and flew for the rope that he'd readied earlier, double-checking the knot around the wooden peg sticking out of the ground. Then he pulled it to the ledge and threw it over, double-checking that it was positioned in the front yard with enough left over to coil on the grass. He took the rope and moved on instinct, body cold and senses sharp with adrenaline, as he descended from knot to knot until he could jump onto the other lawn. He looked up at his island home, no different than the others that he'd seen, and pushed down Debbie's questions to turn and bolt up the porch steps. He took the door handle and spun it, unlocked, then pushed inside. Debbie, he called eyes flicking to the stairs, then the living room, the kitchen doors, before he finally sprinted right for the living room. It was his, the same couch, the same television, the same broken window in the same spots. But that didn't matter. 
Debra! He shouted, arcing out of the living room for the short walkway to one of the kitchen doors. His eyes trailed over everything, hand finding the pantry door and flinging it open. He gasped and coughed as mildew and rot slammed into his nose. He spun away, eyes watering as he wheezed and made for the back door, pushing it open and sputtering Debbie's name a few more times before he cursed. He held his breath through the kitchen and up to the stairs until he pushed her bedroom door open and scanned for her, peeling up the covers to look beneath the bed, flinging the closet open, even breaking her window to scream for her outside once more. Then, panting, he came back to the hall and went to his own room, slamming it open and freezing at the still figure lying atop the sheets. He blinked a few times, breath coming slow and quiet as he stared, waiting for the other to move, to jump, shout, shoot, do something. But the man just sat against the headboard, arms either side of himself, motionless. Michael swallowed, squinting his eyes and carefully lifting his hands to the switch. But none of the lights came on. He crept further into the room, locked on the man as his hands curled into fists, but then he stopped, muscles lax, as narrow eyes opened on the corpse. It was old, the flesh long since rotted into black mummified stains. Mold connected him to the sheets and pillows, growing out from a dark splatter stained into the wall and ceiling, bursting out from the top of his head. His skeletal hands had fallen apart, one palm up, on his side, the other still clutching the shotgun propped against his body, barrels wedged between his teeth. Michael pulled his eyes away from the ruin of his skull to the clothes and shoes. A suit. His suit. The one he was married in. And beside him, his wife's wedding dress lay neatly so the beads and sequins could sparkle though now they were stained with what was once the man's blood. His blood. Then he stopped at the veil, what was beneath it. He walked around the bed and pulled the moth-eaten fabric away only to drop it again on the picture of his wife's and Debbie's faces from the coffee stand downstairs. He backed away, hand going to his mouth as he sputtered a breath, flicking to the man's body and gulping as wide eyes grew wider. Then he fell back on the picture and found the paper beside it, folded halfway beneath. He clenched and unclenched his hand as he took a deep breath and pulled it up to his face, unfolding it. Dear me, it read, I figured I'd make a mess with this ordeal of mine, so I put the note under the picture. Hope it helped. If not, well, I guess you couldn't read this anyway, so I'll just assume it worked and keep writing. It's a bit dramatic, isn't it? But what can I say? I've grown sentimental in my old age. I've been here a long time. I tried, but I just couldn't last any longer. I hope you can do better than me. Live, Michael live because I couldn't, live because they can't, or else what does any of this even matter? Best wishes. Also Michael. It's a shame. Michael shot around, the note falling to the floor as Debbie stood in the doorway, her body just as it had been before the fog. So many of you choose this. It's rather boring, really. The most predictable outcome, and yet you choose it one in twenty times. She crossed her arms with a stern pout, as if she were a grown woman. Do you understand how pathetic that is? What? He flicked to the corpse, Michael's corpse, and back to Debbie. Is that... me? Or... you're not... who are you? What is this... where... why am I here? She smirked and unlaced her arms with a tired sigh. Who's the one with the questions now? Come. She turned and motioned him to follow over her shoulder. 
This way. Michael swallowed and crept toward the door, stopping as Debbie reached the landing and turned to stare at him. All of her shadowed in the light from the window behind. I said, come, Michael. Come and I'll answer your questions. She lifted her hand and motioned toward herself. Then the bedroom door slammed shut and shoved him forward with a curse as he stumbled back to his feet. He turned to the door, then back to the thing posing as his daughter. Come, she said in Debbie's sweet voice. He followed. Let's get the boring part out of the way now that this part of the experiment has outlived its use. Firstly, you aren't in hell. This isn't heaven or purgatory or earth. This is... nowhere. She giggled as they descended the stairs and continued, Michael's eyes watering as they refused to blink. Secondly, you are Michael Larson, iteration 9992. Sorry to tell you that you're not lucky number 10,000, but you'll get there eventually. You were created to serve as the test subject of Lady Marginette, to better understand the mortal mind in a variety of situations and stages of isolation, trauma, and anxiety. They rounded the banister and headed to the front door, the thing that looked like Debbie talking all the while. Thirdly, now that you've been made aware of the reality of your situation, you'll be allowed to live, in this version of your house, to continue on with the next phase of the experiment. She stopped, one hand on the door handle, the other flipping up the light switches beside the door. The lights came on, and she looked up with a pleased sigh. Excellent. It's already begun. Now, follow me, please. She opened the door on the foggy world, pulling them onto the porch as the front door shut on its own, and the fog stirred without a gust of wind. She stopped on the first step and spun to face him. You'll probably want to dispatch with that corpse. If you throw him over the edge, don't worry, he won't come back like your food. However, electricity, water, and said food will continue to be provided as they have been henceforth, but only in this house. If you make your way from this iteration, you'll not find another that will serve your needs. However, this one, luckily for you, is outfitted with a harpoon, which a previous iteration constructed. If you find yourself in need of supplies not given you, wood, metal, so on, simply harpoon another island as it passes and connect them. You're free to explore and roam at your own peril. She smiled curtly, the spark of enjoyment reaching her eyes. Clasping her hands together, she turned and beckoned him on as they rounded the house to the ballista that he'd seen earlier. This is the contraption I'd mentioned. Here's the seat, there's the handle and pedals to turn and hoist it, and these make it fire and retract. She stood with her fingers laced at her lap like a secretary catching him up to speed on what the company would expect of him. Any additional questions? She tilted her head, eyes suddenly far apart and reptilian in their careless stare. Michael licked his lips, then furrowed his brow as something thudded on the air, slow and carefully timed like footfalls. What's that? He stepped forward, then back, fists balled and jaw clenched. What is this place? This is nothing. A place outside of places, created by Lady Marginette, to serve her own purposes outside of the prying eyes of her beloved, if annoying, family. The ground rocked, and Michael braced himself on the wall, then struggled to stand as something pulled him harder and harder to the ground. He strained, yelling as the thing posing as Debbie simply stood and smirked down at him, her eyes still growing farther apart. Then it stopped. Michael collapsed to the ground panting as he pushed himself back up and swiveled around, stumbling with a hand on the house as he made his way back to the front. Then he stopped and stared at the clear, crystal blue sky. His lips parted as he stumbled forward, Debbie appearing beside him. Clouds swirled distantly and there was no sun but the fog was gone, and an ambient light warmed his skin, soaking into his flesh and drying the damp that had wrinkled his fingers. He closed his eyes and breathed through his nostrils, taking in the warm, dry air. And to answer your earlier question, no, I'm not Debbie any more than that dog was Blue, or your wife. He opened his eyes, the grin lilting as he blinked the blur away, and gasped, jumping back as something rose from beneath the edge of his world, rising 
and rising until all of it was in the sky. It was like a misshapen head with all the angles wrong and constantly changing, sitting atop a long, slender neck whose shoulders were lost beneath the edge of his island. But there was no face, just a writhing mass of flesh and strands of muscle and organ and sinew, stitching together before it ripped apart and wove new connections. In some places, giant eyes blinked down at him. In others, ears perked and nostrils flared from between the tentacle bands of muscle. The air vibrated and its flesh trembled, sliding along the curve of the giant's skull and dripping something too dark to be blood. Michael stared, frozen, mouth open as Debbie walked forward, stopping at the edge as the giant head leaned forward. Debbie turned to face Michael and he swallowed, hand reaching out as he took a step, then another, saying something that he couldn't hear as she stepped back. The tendrils of flesh suctioned to her skin and clothes, writhing around her, massaging her until her skin wore away, and her muscle began to dance and writhe with the greater mass. Debra! He shouted, legs giving out beneath him. He fell onto all fours, face wet and hot as he pushed back to stand on his knees. She smiled as her flesh melted away, joining the tendrils of the thing behind her. If you'd like a companion, one can be given you, she said, her voice unaltered as her face peeled away, skin, muscle, and eyes crawling out of place and joining the bleeding serpents that swam around her. It could be Deborah, or Blueberry, even your wife. You need only ask Lady Marginette. Not many have, and it would amuse her to see what you'll do with them. Michael's face twisted as the last of his daughter's body slithered off of her bones into the giant mound, staring down at him. The air was dead. The clouds were still. The only sound was a low hum, almost like breathing as the pulsating creature eclipsed half the sky. What? Why? Michael's voice came clipped and broken as he flicked from eye to eye in the ever-changing hulk of flesh and sinew above him. Then something swam on the air, a guttural jumble of sounds that rumbled out from the fleshy head despite there being no mouth. Then came the ringing, then the red-hot iron in his skull. He gasped and screamed, hands clutching his ears, nails digging into his flesh and leaving bloody trickles down his jaw as he doubled over and gasped for air and words that wouldn't come. Then came the voice, a simple, pleasant voice amid the icy fire twisting in his brains. She wasn't your daughter. She was an avatar by which I was able to monitor your progress. If you desire a companion, I will create one with its own will, so I may observe you without interfering with the experiment. What? What are you? It was little more than a whisper as he bowed his face into the grass and fell to his side sputtering one sharp breath after another as his nails dug deeper and deeper into his temples and scalp. I am one who watched the birth of your race and seeks to understand it better. I am one of many who are greater than you. I am neither flesh nor spirit, nor common or divine. I am Marchinet, keeper of secret places and coveter of knowledge and form. The words whispered in his mind, but beyond, there still was the strange mutterings rumbling on the air, distant and low like a secret from another room. Why am I here? What do you want? He begged, breath rattling, sweat drenching through his clothes as the poker wriggled inside him and touched another part of his brain. His eyes widened as the world flashed away, and he saw them, thousands of his own faces, contained in fractal bands of crystal twine, branching off one another in the creature's own memory. 
each one with their own reactions, their own thoughts and conclusions, their own ends, so many ends, so many at their own hand, so many at Blue's jaws, so many to old age, so many to hunger, as they ventured too far and never found their way back home. They ran together, nearly ten thousand voices, clamoring after the same questions again and again, and coming away with the same answers from a hundred hundred different means, ten thousand different feet and ten thousand different roads with a billion more untraveled. He gasped and flipped onto his back, eyes wide, teeth clenched, body aching. He spasmed, back arching over the grass and rising higher and higher until he balanced himself on his heels and shoulders. He sputtered and foamed from his cheeks, heart pounding in his chest as he fell to his side and jerked and spasmed back and forth. Then, after several tries and sighs from the writhing mass of flesh, he managed to say, Why me? And in his mind, he screamed, Why can't I die? The mass of flesh chuckled and rose further into the sky, shadowing him as it hovered over the yard, blinking a thousand scattered eyes. Then came its alien rumbling voice on the air, and its whispers in his mind shortly thereafter. You have died nine thousand nine hundred and ninety-one times, and you will die at least once more, and forevermore, if that is what I wish. Why? he thought. It chuckled. Because, Michael, of all the mortals I've created in this experiment, none have yielded such fascinating results as you. I'll do it because you're useful. I'll do it because you amuse me. I'll do it because you're the newest plaything in a long line of toys that have proven no longer to entertain or educate. It pulled away, the last a whisper, distant as the poker slid from his brains. Do as you wish, but remember, everything you do profits me, and when you're dead the next one will as well, and the next, and the one after that, and after that, and after that. Then the poker was free, and Michael gasped like he'd been drowning, snapping back forward and coughing up phlegm and foam as he rolled onto his elbows and knees, one hand holding his head and wincing at his claw marks. He turned to find the mass of flesh, rising onto his knees, then jolting back down to vomit in the grass. He wiped his mouth and crawled closer to the edge and the Christmas lights mouth parting as he sank to his hip and elbow, blinking against the blur of the light on the horizon as more vomit toyed at the back of his throat. The fog was thick and gray, splayed out beneath him with a clearing of air like a wake behind the gargantuan mound of flesh walking, slithering through the mist. It was almost human, a snake and a shapeless mass of tendrils, all at once, making his eyes burn the longer that he looked at it. So he blinked and flitted away to find island after island peppering the clearing and the edges of the fog. A hundred, a thousand, ten thousand. They floated in the air, spinning and drifting like dead ships as the fog slowly closed in around them and the creature disappeared behind the rising sea of gray vapor. He swallowed and looked back to the house, his new iteration of it, anyway. Then the archipelago beyond, and beneath him, and down to his hands. His old corpse blossomed in his mind, the shotgun still there. What have I got? he thought. All these versions, and none of them found a way home, none of them left, unless they were dead. Everything's a lie. Nothing I do will ever be real. No matter what I do, even die, it'll only serve her. Her. His face twisted into an ugly scowl, 
fingers digging up the turf beneath him as he set his mouth and pushed up, resisting the urge to vomit as his head swam and he teetered side to side. He glared from under his brow, panting, heart racing around a twisted stomach and balled his fists. I will escape, and I will live. Hey y'all, I hope you enjoyed the final part of this series. It was really fun to write a sci-fi short story, and you know, I think I just might do it again. Anyhow, if you liked the video, make sure that you hit the like button, leave a comment, and if you're feeling extra special generous, subscribe to the channel. But make sure that you ring the bell so that you never miss my bi-weekly uploads. And hey, you know, if you know someone that likes free, original short stories, why don't you share one of my vids with them? There's nothing wrong with spreading the love. It could be this story, it could be one of the two on screen, or it could be any of them that I've uploaded so far. Whatever you choose. I'll see y'all next time. Bye.